Gina, nutrition is a big subject in the last couple of years in development cooperation. And there's also a subject, you know, looking at it in conjunction with other areas because people realize that you can't just look at nutrition without looking at education, health, water and sanitation and agriculture, obviously. Why is it important to look at these things in conjunction? Nutritional status of people also involves many different aspects. So it involves not only getting enough energy, which was the focus maybe in the 70s and 80s, but also making sure that micronutrient uh, requirements are met. And now more and more in this day and age, we're seeing diet-related non-communicable diseases. So it all points to the fact that we need higher diet quality. There's also the aspect um, that we need to consider, the, as we've done in the GIZ study, the UNICEF conceptual framework. So look at the basic causes that lead to malnutrition. In summary, those are food, health, and care, and leading to your immediate causes that lead to your nutritional status, dietary intake, and your health status. So what were the indicators and why was it important that GIZ did this uh, study now? GIZ um, undertook baseline studies, so not me and not Bioversity, but the GIZ project team undertook baseline studies in 10 countries that are part of their One World No Hunger uh, program. And what they did, which was really exciting in this case, was they chose three food-based indicators. So they chose one experiential indicator of food security, but um, looking at it not from a perspective of religious observance or anything like that, but really a food insecurity experience. So they would have chosen to behave differently, but because of monetary constraints and access to food, they weren't able to feed themselves as they feel like they should have. Why does a development implementing agency have to do this? It's part of the One World No Hunger program, which is um, a BMZ program. They're interested in probably, uh, you know, following up on the Millennium Development Goals, but now we're into the Sustainable Development Goals. So it's an international effort, and part of that international effort is focused on nutrition, and part of also the goal of nutrition is to look at how agriculture can become more nutrition sensitive and how we can improve diets through more diversification of agriculture systems. But it as well encompasses aspects of health and care, particularly when you're at program implementation level, because we know that they all work together to influence the ultimate nutrition status. In your first answer, you already went into something that I find quite interesting, is what can agriculture do to improve nutrition? If you say to agriculture you need to produce that and that product, it's not going to create the kind of demand for the product necessarily that has a better nutritional value. We're not talking about you know, big agriculture in this project, in the context of this project. We're really talking about um, the context of you know, very small areas which for the most part are having problems with food security and they're also having problems with diversity of the diet. Agriculture needs to be able to diversify supply and up till now there's been a big focus on staple crops and, and that's the definition of food security as long as I have enough staple crop both to feed my, my family and sell and then the nation has enough staple crop to feed itself this was considered that you're food insecure but I think we've moved way beyond that now to know that there needs to be more diversity in the food supply at different scales. So the context of this project really is at a smaller scale, it's at a more district level scale and what we're talking about is strategies that help those specific communities diversify their food basket. So the strategies could come from own production, from home gardening, from integrated homestead food production, planting more fruit trees, but also from more diversity in the market. So there's many things that one can look at, but we're not looking at sort of multi-industrial types of agriculture as the solution. Mm. So this survey, what, what kind of indicators in terms of behavior change in the broader sense, information that leads to behavior change, which indicators were used? They use a good set of food-based indicators, two indicators that are very particular to diet quality. One is the individual dietary diversity score for women. And using that same data, you can calculate a new indicator called minimum dietary diversity for women. So that's the proportion of women of reproductive age in the population that consume five out of 10 food groups in the previous day. What this indicates is a proxy indicator for the nutrient adequacy of the diet. So the more women who are meeting minimum dietary diversity, the 
probability increases that their micronutrient adequacy from the diet is, is improved. And why that's important is having a better micronutrient status gives you more energy, gives you more potential. Also, women with their reproductive function has better birth outcomes for children, and it, it's uh, protective for the reproductive cycle, for the life cycle. Similar indicators were asked also about children. So these are UNICEF and World Health Organization indicators of minimum acceptable diet, and that's composed of minimum dietary diversity and minimum meal frequency for children of a very specific age range, six to 23 months. So those are the primary uh, indicators for outcome. And then the way you measure if your project is having success is if, if women's knowledge increases, if, you know, in the context of this baseline survey, they were discussing on women, but we had a discussion today during the seminar. Of course, it's important to involve other decision makers in the household, men and grandmothers and other people who influence these uh, dietary intake practices. So it's a whole big effort for behavior change, but I think the baseline is getting people to understand why it's important to diversify, how diverse foods provide different micronutrients and how those different micronutrients help the body function better, particularly for young children and also for women, but for the entire household, it's an important strategy. Then uh, there's a particular target audience of agriculture, so ag extension and people at national level making agriculture policies, for them to also understand why it's important to have a diversified agriculture production system. GIZ's findings indicate that there's quite a variety or difference in results between the different countries. Can you explain that? Or do you have an idea why that could be? Is that maybe because the results are measured in a different way also? Is it well, yeah. I mean, one of the indicators is a food insecurity indicator. And that the purpose of that indicator is to assess the, uh, the experience of food insecurity. And the other two indicators, the minimum acceptable diet and the minimum dietary diversity for women, are really more about um, the adequacy of the diet that also includes micronutrient adequacy. So there are two different nutritional concepts really that are being measured. So you don't necessarily expect in all situations for the indicators to be looking exactly the same. What was very interesting when I looked at the summary of the 10 baseline studies was that in some populations, uh, food insecurity is a big problem. For example, in Kenya, in these results, because of the area in which the study was 70%, undertaken, yeah. yeah, up to 80 percent. Whereas in other countries, Ethiopia and India, they weren't experiencing, from their perspective, from the perspective of the woman reporting, so much food insecurity. But what was interesting is um, there were differences in in population meeting minimum acceptable diet and minimum dietary diversity for women, but in general, they were pretty low. So even when a population was more, uh, experienced less food insecurity, such as the case in India, their dietary diversity was low. Also, Ethiopia was a case that I remember. So why would that be? And it's written in that baseline study that the woman could have been fasting on different days of the week. So in a way, the, the, the huge difference in the, in the felt insecurity is at least partly an indication that you need to adjust your, your, your programs and look at these countries in that way and that country in that way. Am I right? If we're just trying to break down what's happening in Kenya, they might not even be able to meet their needs for calories, their needs for dietary energy. Whereas it would seem, but we haven't looked, you know, the, it would seem, but you would have to investigate it uh, really, that in India and maybe, you know, the countries that had, were experiencing less food insecurity, that they were more able to meet their caloric needs. Whereas based on these proxy indicators of micronutrient adequacy, I would guess that most of the populations in the baseline are, are suffering some, from micronutrient deficiency. Is there any basic recommendation that you think that the, the program should maybe adjust its, its way, its way of looking at it or its approach? So we just did the summary analysis of the 10 baseline surveys, so the actual data collection and, and all that hard work was done by other teams. But um, yeah, I mean, the seminar was very informative today to sort of point out maybe a few things that could have um, come out more. So um, it's quite important, I think, to also do some barrier analysis and some more qualitative research to look at those areas where 
we might have questions that need to be further explored. So why was it, for example, in Kenya and Ethiopia that women could say, yes, I know it's important that I give my child a diversified diet, I know it's important that I feed my child more frequently, yet they're not practicing it in the observed indicator of minimum acceptable diet. So there might be gender barriers, you know, there, there could be that the woman doesn't have control of, of monetary resources to buy the food that she has learned is important to buy. Uh, there could be other reasons, influences of older family members, grandmothers or other people. So that gender aspect was something that came out that really maybe could be looked at a little bit more in the, uh, by the project teams. Last question from my side now. When I first arrived in Africa and I was in workshops like that, I was always amazed by all the needs assessment. And then I was even more amazed if some Africans stood up and said, well, guys, we don't need another needs assessment. You come here and make needs assessment, needs assessment. We know what we need. Is there anything that you can see through from what was taken, the data from that people were indicating that they, whether they do or not, whether they really need or that they do know already what they need? Yeah, I mean, that's a kind of tough question to try and ascertain from this type of data collection. So I agree with you completely that data fatigue and just collecting information for the sake of collecting information is really not a good idea. So I do feel, having been part of the process for, for the last year, that it was very carefully considered which types of data to collect and not just to collect data for collecting data itself. So a good example of that, and it even came out in the seminar today, was people said, why didn't you collect information on anthropometry? So that's when you measure children's height vis-a-vis uh, -vis their age, their weight vis-a-vis -vis their age, and their height vis-a-vis uh, -vis their weight. Yes, it's a very important uh, indicator to have, but the people around the table making decisions about data collection decided that in the life of a two or three year project, those indicators aren't the most likely indicators to change. Therefore, rather than expose the population to even more data collection, when we don't have really plausible reason to think, for example, stunting, which is height for age, could change, we won't collect it. So you get criticized if you do and criticized if you don't, but your point is very well taken. And then the other point is this information should absolutely go back to the populations because they also can come up with their own, you know, you, you, you sit with them and you say, look, we found out that only 7% of women here are meeting this threshold of five food groups out of 10. And then we look at the food groups. These are the food groups that a lot of women consume and these are the food groups that hardly any women consume. What, can, what strategies that you can think of to help diversify the diet? Can you plant more fruit trees? Can you utilize the fruit more? Can you have a home garden and grow more vegetables? Can we start to you know, drink some milk, give some eggs rather than selling it all? So I think, yes, you have to sit, show the results to the communities themselves because ultimately it's them who have to come up with their own solutions. But it's a standardized way for GIZ to track what the problem looks like using a standardized set of mm. indicators. What do you think is the most counterintuitive, uh, promising sort of insight that you maybe gained from, from, from the uh, looking at what the studies have brought up? Without a doubt, there it's, it provides a very good benchmark for that moment in time in which those indicators were collected, really what was the situation, how much people were diversifying. So it gives you a lot of ideas, again, breaking it into the food group analysis. We can see what food groups we want to look at and which food groups um, you know, most of the population are already consuming. So it gives you quite a lot of insight if you start to look at the data in this way. Now, um, some of the surprising things, um, but I guess it wouldn't surprise you if you had, had read the Millennium Development Goal Reports, was I found it uh, encouraging that quite a lot of the populations, and these are really underserved populations, had access to safe water, but on the contrast, access to safe sanitation was really lagging behind. So there's, of course, always hope, and there's always room for improvement, but there are certainly some aspects like that that were a, lot, a long ways to go. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you too.